So, uh, Marianne, Mariano, I was just uh, telling you a bit uh, about who you are and how you are investing, but I know that you can say this uh, much better than I do. You have, uh, of course, all the knowledge to, to tell them about that. Uh, we are very impressed uh, by your performance, and uh, that's why we have invited you uh, tonight to, to give us uh, this webinar and this presentation. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my screen to you and uh, ask if you can hear me. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation and hello everyone, thanks for joining the webinar. Um, so, let me open this. And so, first of all, I would like to tell you a little about myself and how I started to invest. Ever since I was a child, I was uh, truly passionate about technology, programming, and economics. And when I was 18 years old, I started looking for ways to invest the money I was saving. And investing in tech companies, for me, was a way of putting together all the things I was most interested in. And over time, my passion on these areas only grew. Although soon after I began to invest, I expanded to other industries besides technology. My background is that I first made a bachelor in economics, and then I got my master's degree in systems engineering at the National University of Central Buenos Aires. I actually started programming in 2005 and investing in 2010. I joined Nitoro in 2013. And by 2015, I had already become a popular investor. So uh, what I am doing right now, I'm currently working as a software engineer for AWS, Amazon Web Services. This is the cloud computing division of Amazon. But I've already decided uh, to quit. And from December, I will be working full-time full investing on eToro. And I also recently started a project with which I will try to share company analysis, that, uh, statistics, news, and other types of information with the aim of helping investors to better understand the companies in which they are investing. I think there is uh, too much information available about companies, but it isn't always easy to find or understand and in general only professional investors and hedge funds end up making use of all of this information so my goal is going to be to simplify the access for everyone uh, for now i only have a very early beta version with only a handful of companies but if anyone is interested in looking at it, you can do it by visiting uh, inspectcompany.com. Although you can expect a much more advanced version of the, project, the, of the project next year. So now let's, after my introduction, let's uh, get started. Uh, what's my strategy? I'm a long-term investor who invests mainly in stocks. My strategy consists in deeply analyzing each one of the companies that I think it could be a good investment opportunity. For each one of these companies, I estimate their intrinsic value and I project their growth rate over the next quarter, the next year, the next three years, and the next five years. Um, to help me carry out all of this analysis, I use uh, scrapping and machine learning software that I built myself, which allows me to collect and categorize large amounts of data about each company, its competitors, its industry, and yeah, the markets in general. Um, so I use these programs to obtain different statistics for each company. For example, the sentiment of the consumers about the main products and services of each company. Also, I look into the shop searches that each company is conducting and including 
how is it for a company to attract and maintain new talent? And also the general feeling of the employees about the company. Uh, so what data do I use? I analyze different data uh, depending on the company. Uh, for instance, for pharmaceuticals, I estimate on average how long the researchers stay in the company because researchers usually give a lot of importance to their career. So if a company has problems return, retaining researchers for a long period of time, it might be an indication that things are not actually going so well. But however, if researchers do stay for a long period of time, it may be an indication that the company is actually uh, close to a breakthrough. Um, then in addition for, actually mainly for tech companies, I try to find out the level of innovation and new technologies that each company is developing. Uh, for this, I follow daily the technology blogs and open source projects of these companies. And I also perform sentiment analysis to understand not just my views, but the overall feeling of the community about these technologies. And yes, uh, like this, there are a lot of sources of information uh, where you can find interesting patterns, like the housing market or the traffic nearby a company headquarters, just to name a few. So um, how do I decide to invest or not? I make my decisions based on all the data I collected and classified and other manual analysis that I perform in each company. I only invest in companies that I believe are going to grow, but are also price at a fair value and have strong financials. This is actually a very important factor for me because if we happen to have a bigger market or the recession, these companies will be the less impacted and most likely they are going to recover soon after. So what are the results of this strategy? This strategy allowed me to consistently outperform the markets. Since January 2015, I got a return of 211%, while in the same period of time, NASDAQ 100 had a return of 83%, and Dow Jones and the S&P 500 have even less than that. I included in the slide a chart that I took from Mitoro in which you can see the returns of my portfolio compared with uh, these indexes. The chart starts in January 2017. And you can see how I ended up outperforming all of these uh, indices in, since then. And for people watching this webinar in the future, uh, you can always see this chart up to date in the that section of my eToro profile. Um, so now I'd like to tell you a little about my vision for the future. Um, on the one hand, I think we are going to go through a period of high volatility on the markets. There are many events that can have a big impact on the markets like Brexit, trade tensions and the US 2020 elections. And we're in a moment where a tweet or a comment on the Fed actions can end up having huge uh, impact on the market. And very importantly, on the other hand, I think there is a greater awareness in general about the environment and the planet. Uh, more and more people are taking action, changing their habits to try to help the environment. And 
I think this is going to have a big impact on certain companies since consumers are going to look more and more products from companies that prove to be environmentally and socially responsible. Uh, also, today, news about the company's good actions can become viral and reach millions of people through social networks. But the same, and even on a much larger scale, can happen with news about negative actions, right? Um, if bad news become viral, I don't know, for example, because of the company polluting the environment or not being socially responsible in some way, I think it can impact the image of the company in such a way that it will be very difficult for, uh, to recover from it, no matter how much marketing strategies are tried. Personally, I'm very happy that this is a new trend because I believe the consumers have the power actually to improve the world. And at the same time, as an investor, it's something I'm working much more on incorporating even more actually into my strategies. Um, since I believe that companies that are not responsible or it's not actually very clear whether they are or not, are going to have a much higher risk. On the, uh, on the one hand, they can end up with a bad image and lose consumers. And on the other hand, politicians are being increasingly pressured to create new regulations that help the environment. And as a, as a consequence, they may end up harming these companies. I think this is going to be an increasingly important factor to consider before investing in any company. So if you decide to copy my investments, you can open an eToro account if you still don't have one and follow the steps on the page to start copying me. Um, regarding how much money to use, this is a very common question that I get. Um, I believe the amount to copy me depends on what everyone feels uh, comfortable investing. Personally, I believe that the technique of dollar cost averaging can be very useful here. Uh, this technique basically consists on investing a fixed amount each month or a fixed percentage of, month, of your monthly income. And this technique is a way for an investor to neutralize short-term uh, volatility in the market. And very importantly, I will recommend copying me for at least four to six months. If the copy time is shorter, um, actually the short-term market volatility may end up influencing as much as the return of my own investments. And this means uh, that in the short term, it's very likely that we are going to end up having good days and good weeks, and we are going to have bad days and bad weeks. But I strongly believe uh, that having a long-term vision ends up having its benefits. So if you are considering copying me, I will recommend doing it with an amount of money that you feel comfortable uh, keeping it invested for at least four to six months. Um, but of course, I welcome everyone to copy me for a longer period of time. Um, actually, the average copy, uh, copy time of my portfolio is around a year. And I have seen many, many users copying me successfully actually for multiple years. 
So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to the webinar. Um, and if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to ask them. I think we are doing very well with the time, so I think we have a lot of time for questions. Okay, uh, Mariano. So I have some questions myself, and also I see that uh, some uh, some questions are already coming in. So please, everyone, uh, just uh, put your questions in the questions box, and then we'll uh, post them to uh, Mariano. So first of all, uh, uh, Mess uh, is uh, asking, how do you backtest your strategy, and uh, which soft software do you use? Yes, uh, about software. Um... For scraping data uh, on the internet, social networks, and all of that, and uh, I use a, a scrapper that I built myself. And for machine learning, I use Keras. I uh, use deep reinforcement networks, which is a um, machine learning technique for that allows you to classify classify and understand text in an efficient way. Um, the thing uh, for backtesting, I I have been using many tools like Backtester and all the common ones. Um, but since things, when you use actually machine learning based on the sentiment of the consumers, actually things change a lot. So you don't actually, uh, it wouldn't be smart actually, or you, I try it and you don't get the best results if you backtest against previous data. What you actually try to do is to improve your model against the current data you have. So you can um, train always just with the last quarter and always analyze against the last quarter. Um, like, let me give you an example. If I'm looking uh, something that I have been doing recently, um, looking at reviews for games and companies like Net Game Movies and all that information for I have gaming companies and have uh, Netflix. Um, I've been looking on reviews by country, and I have been classifying the sentiment of the people around social networks. Um, my objective here is to uh, improve how I understand how people is feeling and not much uh, actually, but it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to backtest that kind of information um, because also you don't, you cannot get probably information from years ago. It's actually very hard. Uh, you usually get the information in real time. Um, but the point is in understanding how consumers are feeling and understanding it's people actually renewing their Netflix account, it's people getting a new Netflix account, or it's people actually abandoning the service and going through an alternative. You are trying to look for these details, um, but yeah, depends on the use case in, uh, Depends on which uh, data I am anal analyzing at the moment. Okay, uh, Mess, I hope this uh, was uh, sufficient uh, for an answer. And uh, Kenan is asking, uh, where do you get your data from? Uh, you said that you're scraping, but then it's all kind of websites, or where, where do you actually get it from? Uh, depends on the data. Like I use different sources depending on the data and I'm analyzing. Like you can get traffic data if you are interested in traffic in real time from Google APIs. Uh, you can get um, from social networks, you can get a lot of sentiments and people commenting on their actions if they are watching a show, a movie, uh, where they work, like every a lot of people today put um, update their Twitter profile or LinkedIn or whatever social network they are using uh, with the place they are currently working. So you can know how many people are starting to work in it or you can estimate how many people are starting to work in a company. Also, you can track like uh, companies 
always depending on the kind of company but always they publish papers and usually then you can get the name of the top researchers because papers usually are addressed with the, the name of their team of researchers and you can look if those how long those researchers uh, through social networks are staying in the company are they actually moving to a different company after they publish that paper i don't know it's six months later they are moving to a different company that's a, a red flag for me um uh, and of course i try to find patterns like one person moving can be an outlier if you have i know 50 people of 200 that you were looking are moving okay there is a very red flag going on um, but yeah where i get the data depends on the data that i'm getting i hope this answered the question Yes, yes, I think so. Um, Christian is asking, uh, how do you use machine learning in your trading? Uh, and then he's asking a little bit technically, like uh, if you're using neural networks or decision trees or something else, uh, could, could you say something about that without getting too technical? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, I'm using actually neural networks. Um, I'm using uh, depending on actually in the use case but mostly i'm working with something that is called um deep reinforcement neural network which is used for nlp which is a uh, natural language processing uh, this basically is understanding natural text uh, understand so you can if you can understand the text you can classify it and from that you can um get your data because the problem with uh, machine learning is that i don't use machine learning for saying like give me the price on the next month of this stock because that wouldn't work right what i do is uh, there are millions of data points through internet that you can get about any data and it's almost impossible for a person to go through all of that data and understanding it so i use machine learning actually to classify that data and get uh, statistical projections, get averages, uh, get outliers on that data. But yeah, okay. uh, short answer, yeah. yes, I use neural networks. Yes, okay, I see. Um, then I was, uh, I was thinking about um, uh, you, you said that you wanted to, uh, or you're actually calculating the intrusion uh, value of a company. Can, can you give an example of what data you're using to do that? Because I'm interested in, you also said that there's so many data out there, so much data out there, and uh, it's difficult to find out uh, for people what they should actually use. So what kind of data are you using to, to calculate the intrinsic value? Uh, well, yes, the, basically all of this data that I was talking about is what I use for the intrinsic value. I don't have like a specific formula for that applies to every case because I don't think actually such a thing exists. Um, what I do, I just uh, all the time I looking into new data and I create new models and I look whether that model may actually influence in the future of the company sometimes this is a little of um you you are not never certain if some data is influencing on the company but you can find patterns uh, i don't know I, I, as i was saying before um i use traffic data around the headquarters of a company to and and the to understand if uh, some companies like, I don't know, Amazon that it's in Seattle and it's huge on Seattle and it's very located there. With tra traffic data and with um, the housing market, how many people is renting new places, buying new places, how are the prices around the Amazon offices in Seattle or the Google office in Mountain View or Facebook in Merlot Park, uh, Apple in Cupertino, you can, uh, get data about how they are hiring and if you look at how this data matches actually the reported hiring uh, that they do every quarter or some companies every year uh, you can find some patterns it's not perfect but it's a way that you can 
you can understand how well the company is doing in hiring, which is for me, hiring is critical. And it's one of the things I look the most um, because a company, because especially when you're looking for engineers from researchers, scientists, hiring is very competitive and very hard. And you can only have more people, not if you hire more, but if you can retain the people you are hiring. And that's a critical part because any company can just hire people, but retaining them, it's very hard. Uh, it's usually, especially on researchers, it's not just about giving them more money uh, and scientists, right? It's not about money. The, these people want to work in something that has a future. And if the company has very a lot of projects that have a good future, they are going to be able to retain them, uh, those people. Uh, otherwise, using this kind of data, you can understand that the company is not doing such uh, so well. And yeah, use basically all of this data I'm going getting there and there to get an to get my intrinsic value that will be actually it's not just a value. I get a, per, a percentage of probabilities of a value. Like I say, okay, the intrinsic value for me is that I know X company. Uh, I think it's. 70% chance that they, their intrinsic value is between 90 and 100. 10% chance that it's in this range and the rest in this range or something. I like I set a set of ranges and probabilities on each range, basically. Okay, I was wondering like uh, if, if you could get, give an example, like uh, I see in your portfolio, Alphabet is the company that you have uh, invested uh, the largest portion of your portfolio and it's almost 5% of, of your funds. Yes. Uh, and and if, if we speak about, uh, let's say, did you calculate the intrinsic value of Alphabet, which is the, the mother company of Google, or how did you actually approach investing in Google? Yes, of course. Um... Yes, I did calculate uh, on Google. I think Google is doing, in hiring, it's amazing. They have a huge retention on, of employees, especially on scientists and engineers. And also I look a lot of the grow areas, like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Um, Google, um, or a company that is so large as Alphabet, um, I actually I do, I do this uh, all this data analysis in each of its uh, sub organizations, like I analyze to Google, Waymo, Nest, Google DeepMind, X Developments, and Capital C, GB, um, and then the small the small project usually don't are so important in terms of future money, but I try to look at all of them. And for Google, for Alphabet in specific, I think they are going to do great in self-driving cars and ride sharing. Um, they have Waymo and Waymo, all the data I got on Waymo, uh, for, for me, it's showing that it's going to be very strong. Um, the company is by far the one that has the most um, amount of miles uh, on, on public roads and in virtual virtual environments, and they are already live testing self driving a uh, self driving taxi uh, service and self driving trucks in Arizona. Um, and also, a lot of people don't look so much in investments. But actually, actually uh, Alphabet owns a 5% of Uber and a 5% of Lyft. So which is not a small detail. And going to other areas, uh, cloud gaming, for instance, Google is launching uh, Stadia, uh, which is a cloud-based gaming platform. Uh, basically, you can play games that run on Google's hardware. And if you are paying the, the pro subscription, you can get, uh, a, they are promising a 60 FPS on 4K. 
um, which is amazing that you can do that on real time. I still don't, I'm not sure how it's experienced, but I look a lot into the hiring across um, Stadia. Google publishes hiring in many teams and from the positions you can understand, yeah, these people is likely that they are hiring for Stadia, even if they don't say so. And the retention is amazing. So I think they are actually doing something great with this product. Um, and something that is very impressive about Google is uh, Google DeepMind. Um, for those of you, of you who don't know this company, um, this company is using AI to solve some of the world's hardest problems like understanding protein folding and identifying diseases. Um, and this company is making breakthroughs that they were estimated to be many decades from now, like beating the world's champion on a game of Go and again, predicting protein unfolding. This is, has been one of the most challenging problems in medicine because understanding protein unfolding can give you, can help you to treat a lot of diseases uh, that are produced by this. And the company is constantly making breakthroughs. Uh, and I, I think Google is starting to, for now as a research company, but now it's starting to monetize that, which is going to be huge. Um, for instance, uh, DeepMind already helped Google Pixel, uh, the phone, to improve its camera and battery life using machine learning. So using machine learning, they are able to get a better a picture that is much better than the actually camera that they built. And also, they they are actually now Google is using AI and mostly the AI produce it on, on DeepMind across the entire organization. Um, they, for instance, um, DeepMind uh, made this project where they optimize, I don't remember, like a 20, 30% uh, the energy consumption across the entire uh, Google data centers just by optimizing the cooling system through machine learning, which is amazing. And um, yeah, I think that's. Ah, yeah, another okay, thing that's... that I almost uh, forgot. Yeah. Google is investing in a lot of companies. It's one actually Alphabet. In, it's one of the companies that it's investing the most, and it has invested like Google. Um, I made an estimation that they own an eight percent of SpaceX. They own a part of Airbnb. They own a part of Snapchat they own part of Cloudflare and probably more than 10 publicly traded uh, companies, which is, I think this company is clearly, for me at least, the intrinsic value is much higher than the current market value. That's why I invest so much in this company. Okay, very interesting. Um, I was thinking about uh, the timing in your investing like like do you uh, look at specific uh, elements about timing now you're saying like there's a kind of a trade war going on there there's brexit uh, coming up in uh, i mean in some way uh, do you think about timing at all or do you just invest in good companies uh, sometimes i no, i always consider timing uh, but I actually think longer term that a trade war, like if I think a company like Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and yeah, short term, they may end up uh, losing value because of the trade war. For me, that losing value is actually a buying opportunity because I don't think these companies long term are going to get affected by, like they can get affected somehow in that they may end up like Google. Google just took all its uh, production factories from China and started moving to uh, Vietnam. And yes, that may end up in some higher cost short term. And you can have a 
short term slowdown in your productions until you reassemble everything in a different country. But these companies are, for me, are above these trade conflicts. Brexit, um, if you look in specific European companies, I think it, this actually can have a big impact. And yes, it made me change some of my uh, trading decisions. Uh, if you see my portfolio, actually, I reduced a lot my presence on Europe uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, I have, I don't know, six or seven European companies, uh, companies trading actually, not just European, companies trading in Europe uh, stock exchanges. And now I think I have two. I, I only have BMW View and Arbus. Um, but yeah, it made me actually, also the problems that are going on economically in Germany and all the stuff made me uh, not invest in Europe a lot. Okay, uh, you were also speaking about the, the environment and this uh, conscience that many consumers are getting. Uh, what what actual companies do you think that would be, I, are, you in, uh, are you investing in based on this uh, trend? Yes, of course. Um, I, I this is something that I'm. It's what I'm working right now uh, in improving the data I'm getting about of the companies. It's not easy to get exactly this data, uh, how social responsible every company is. But I'm working on this. Um, for instance, I'm investing a lot on Tesla, but Tesla is very obvious that it's amazing for the environment. Um, but some companies like, for instance, Microsoft, Microsoft has been uh, carbon neutral for almost a decade now, eight years, which is very ahead of the time if we compare with other companies. So that's something that makes me, it's an extra incentive for me to invest in Microsoft. Uh, basically, it's a multiplier that I'm increasing all the time, the socially and environmentally responsible. Um, Apple is making their companies uh, work with solar energy, and Google also is producing a lot of renewable energy. Actually, Google, I think, is producing much more energy that they consume, which is great because they are actually uh, donating that extra energy. Um, other companies, are, I'm trying to stay away from companies that are clearly not um, not doing so, uh, so well. For instance, I I'm never going. To, I I don't invest in anything related to oil and energy companies that work with uh, not green energies. Um, even if them now the oil was a, there was a conflict, the oil spiked. And some companies benefit from that. I actually not interested in that short-term profit uh, because I think that that's very risk. That's a very risky investment because for me it's not the it's clearly not the future. So I will always stay away from those companies. Okay. Um... Uh, and then I'm just going to say to people, if you have any last questions, then just uh, you should post them now, uh, because this is uh, one of my last questions, which is, uh, uh, do, do you consider momentum uh, as a factor in, in your investing, like in, investing in, in companies that are actually uh, investor darlings, uh, companies that have uh, risen in value uh, recently? Yes and no. Um... I don't look at momentum for short-term trading. Like, um, if a company, I, I want to invest in a company just because it has been increasing in value on for the last X days. Uh, I'm not interested in that kind of investment. Um, all I do is always thinking in how I think this company or how I, what is my analysis on this company for the next six months. 12 months, two years, three years. I, I'm not interested in these short-term gains. Um, I do look at momentum sometimes when actually, when it's negative, um, which a company I think it has been oversold uh, for some reason, like 
uh, Tesla a few months ago when it went to, I think it was like something like 1800 in its lower value. The company was oversold and that's for me it's an opportunity, uh, buying opportunity. I try to, when I think a company is actually cheap, I try to follow it down or following up. Um, but not because I'm trying to, I use that as an opportunity to buy, but I'm not going to sell soon after to gain that 1% or 2%. I will, I only buy if I buy in because I trust the company long term and I will keep that um, that position probably for many months. Okay, and and how 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 long do you usually keep your your positions? Uh, depends on the company. I don't have uh, uh, any strategy based on timing. Uh, I uh, I'm running the, my analysis all the time in all the every company in my portfolio. If as soon as something changes or the probabilities of something changing, uh, I basically I can consider closing or opening more on that position. I don't have any standard on timing. Sometimes there are things that you cannot predict. You buy a company and then two weeks later you had uh, some news or something happened with that company that make, makes you change your mind and I will just close it even if I just bought it. And But sometimes a company like Alphabet uh, you, you always, for me, this company, um, Alphabet and Microsoft have been two companies that I have held for actually a very long period of time, probably already, I think, many years already. I, I have had more or less, like I'm going, I'm selling small positions, buying or small positions depending on, or my analysis, but I always have some uh, investment in these companies um, just because my analysis is all the time uh, returning positive, returning that these companies are going to increase in value. The day my analysis changes, I will sell, but for now it has been years where constantly my analysis has been positive in these companies. Okay, Marenia, yeah. I, uh, I think that was uh, all for now. Uh, that was all the questions and uh, I've been, uh, it has been very interesting to, to have you here tonight. And uh, I, would, I would say thank you for, for coming tonight. I think it was uh, very insightful what you told us about the different companies and the way you are investing. So uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. And thank you everyone for joining and listening to this webinar.